however you want. Okay, that's fine. Well, so why don't I just start? Um, so um, thank you everybody for um, for taking a bit of time out um, this evening for this talk. Um, my name is Harbin David, I'm a partner at Hawkins Brown um, Architects and we know Sheffield um, School of Architecture really well because um, Roger studied there, Roger Hawkins actually studied there and um, he pops back to do crits and he's very supportive of the school and um, both of us know SAT really well and what we do is that every year we always take on one of the Sheffield Climbing graduates and actually um, undergrad and postgrad as well. And um, I think it's been a really tough year for everybody. And what we want, what I really wanted to do was, was maybe sort of let um, you guys know what it's gonna be like when you enter practice. Because I think I sense, I mean, we definitely are, we're changing the way we work. But what I really wanted to do was actually um, for the talk to be created by people that were your age. Um, and this was us pre-COVID when we could literally, I mean, who knows when this will ever happen again, when you're sort of literally like sort of like sardines. Um, but um, but we, let me just check, sorry, is it moving? Ah. And, um, but this is it, we, we, I don't know if anybody knows the work that we do, but we're essentially everything about engineers, um, so architects over designers, interior designers. And I was going to talk about the work in various sectors and where we see there being um, opportunities um, within the sectors. But um, these are three graduates that actually put the, the, the presentation together um, because I was very keen that they show you, uh, um, I suppose, give you a flavour of how they see um, practice shaping up. So this is Andreas on the top left. Um, he just did his undergrad um, at Bristol, his postgrad at MSA. And then there's PQ who studied at the Bartlett and then the AA. And then there's Justin Bean who was Bath and then he finished off at the Royal. And, and they work at, at the, at the Bartlett. I actually asked him, I said, can you please give me just two lines explaining one image? And they all sent me three pages of text each. So I'm not going to explain what their work is, but there you go. That was them. But they're all... I think Justin at the top right, he won the, uh, the silver medal uh, for year three um, last year. So this is very much through their eyes. So what's our biggest sector at the moment? Our biggest sector is residential. You've probably heard on the news that actually the government isn't going to be able to achieve their housing targets this year. Why? Because um, many of the Eastern European labor has left the country. Um, how many homes do we need to build? 300,000 a year, so we're probably hitting 250. In London alone, um, we're looking to build sort of 60,000, 50, 60,000. And on the left there, you've got um, Sadiq. And Sadiq's walking past one of our schemes, which I'll talk about later on, which is um, um, the most environmentally sustainable social housing in the whole of London. And on the right, you probably recognise it. It's the sort of Park Hill, and we designed that with Studio Grey West. Um, so residential, I sense, I mean, at the moment for us, the sector is ballooning. Um, it's really growing. Why? Because there's, often, there's just not enough homes. It's sort of supply and demand. And um, what everybody craves now more than ever is that space. And actually what everybody's scratching their head is that what are the homes of the future going to be like? If you're doing a 3-2 where you're at home two days a week or three days a week, uh, can that really be sustained? Or can you, can you really keep the same flat types or house types? Commercial, this is workspace. I mean, look, for us as a practice, we tend not to do the big sort of shiny towers. Others do that work. What we tend to do is take an existing building and breathe new life into it. Um, and here, this is a picture of the gantry. This is a project that we did um, um, at Here East, which is in the Olympic Park. I sense what's going to happen. What we sense is that actually every, every sort of, every company is going to look at their office, which currently at the moment, no one's entering. And they're going to say, right, over the next three months, how do we how do we change this? How do we change the interior when we know that actually people are only going to be coming in three days a week? So what you're going to find is you're going to have workstations completely flexible, but you're going to have a raft of meeting rooms and spaces. So you, people are going to be expected to come in two days a week. They have a laptop. They work for a few hours. They have a meeting. They interact in the best possible space, and then they go home. That's how it's going to be. So there's going to be a rollout of an interior commercial fit out. Is there going to be more shiny towers in the city of London? Possibly later on, but probably not now. Um, infrastructure. I think you always hear governments talking about infrastructure. And um, I was listening to a conference um, by our lawyers and they had their global heads 
from uh, across um, um, all the continents. And everyone said that every government is going to borrow money, invest in their infrastructure, and we're doing the same. Why? Because when you do infrastructure, you're designing for the future, but also you retain all the money within um, the economy. So what's happening now is as everybody's pulled up their borders, what they want to do is get local talent <coughs> to invest in infrastructure. And what's the big project at the moment is HS2. HS2 is the big project that's been delivered and that'd be that take 10 years. So if you are into infrastructure, they're the firms and practices that you need to sort of target. However, infrastructure also means streets. So Rishi Sunak, who is our um, who is our chancellor, and um, what he's done is that he's basically allocated money for um, cities. And what he's saying is that um, you will apply for funds to renew your public realm, like the future high street, what should it be? Um, and you have to use it in a certain amount of time. So what we're finding out more and more is that local authorities are approaching us. So that, I mean, Sheffield is a big thing about sort of like society, civic, public realm, et cetera, community focused. I see that happening more and more outside of London, very much the levelling up. I don't think Boris is going to go back on his word. He needs the votes um, for the next election. And so I think you'll see that work uh, trickling through. And education. Education. I mean, you guys, I think, have had a, a really tough time at the moment because, um, you know, you're at home and you can't really enjoy the facilities on campus that you're um, that. Um, you know, you, you 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 should be, and you could have. What we're finding is that the edge is, is the state departments are now really scratching their head, going, "Well, actually, do we need these buildings? Um, do we need new, or actually, do we need to repurpose?" So, actually, what we have found is a dip, right? Because everybody's trying to justify the spend. So, what they are doing is thinking about what they need to be doing. Um, so, we sense that's going to go um slightly quiet over the next sort of like year or so but then potentially pick up why because all the main universities what they they're competing against american universities and and they're in competition um but we'll see we'll see how that pans out we'll see what students are going to do in terms of um investing in higher education um don't know don't know jury's out at the moment there um, civic community and culture this is another one of our sectors what we find is that no one's building I'm, I'm actually a trustee of an art gallery in west london uh, pits hanger manor that was designed by john so all of our staff are furloughed look at the vna all the staff are furloughed um some of the galleries they can barely afford the heating you know they're just struggling with that but it is going to bounce back but it's going to be sort of interesting um which galleries do no one's designing a new gallery at all that's for sure but what we are finding is that all uh, local authorities are looking at their estates and what they are saying is is that how can we rationalize our estate actually what is the town hall for we've actually picked up three town hall projects where we're completely remodeling the council's assets right because what they are is that they need to justify their estate and how does it serve the community and that's really interesting work um and healthcare, this for us is a new sector. You've probably heard Boris. I mean, at the moment, you know, everybody's, you know, um, relying on the NHS and they're doing an absolutely sort of like sterling job. But what we've realised now is that actually we probably haven't got the sort of health infrastructure um, that the country um, really sort of like needs. Um, we have an ageing population um, who knows what's going to happen with COVID. And actually what we're doing now is that we've actually sort of aligned ourselves and we've won several hospitals. And the image on the right is we just won a recent project which was the Cambridge Children's Hospital and I think for us what we really want to do is is actually sort of like make design hospitals that generally heal maybe the architecture can heal and I think a lot of hospitals that we see um arguably probably don't do that so I think Boris has looked to spend 40 billion on healthcare so there's a pipeline of hospitals um coming through and urban design urban design I think is is uh, a, a big one that is going to trickle through. Um, this image here is actually Clapham Junction. We did a scheme for Network Rail where we took the station and we, you know, we sort of like proposed, can the development above the station actually pay for the infrastructure? It never does, um, simply because the infrastructure in the UK costs so much to actually build. But what um, cities and boroughs and rail operators will be doing is looking at how can they realise development on their estates? Um, what is the future of the station? You know, before you'd have a morning peak 
everybody jumps on the train between seven and eight and then they jump on the train station between six and seven right that's not happening anymore so actually do you need to make stations bigger but then um, if you're not then actually how can you how do stations then um, serve their communities what do they really become so that's really interesting um how will they be used I and mean, that's something that we're grappling with at the moment but i think the big thing for you guys and for all of us but i think particularly i mean like my son who's 11 when i ask him what's worrying you it's always about um global warming and i think um we all need to do something about it and you know the, the way it started is 50 percent of all energy that comes out the ground is used in construction so i think for us as an industry if we can just shave off five percent that's a lot that's a lot now boris boris loves his target so you know 2015 2050 carbon zero uk 2030 you know um we i won't be able to buy my three liter bmw v12 joking i'd actually own a car but you know it's going to be all electric and so what he's doing is that he's put these targets in place so effectively we're going to have this ripple effect where the infrastructure that needs to support those targets needs to be put into place and that's a really interesting place to be yes i was actually doing this talk um from a fellow of the institute of chartered engineers even though i'm an architect and i was doing a talk to graduates of engineering at imperial which they told me was the best school of engineering in the world um but i was saying to them i was going look guys you guys are going to be the, the, the rock stars of the future because actually you're the ones who are really sort of saving the planet in the sense that um for us to really deal with sustainability um you need the infrastructure in place and the picture on the right is is just taken you know it's a few weeks ago so those floods were happening once every like 80 90 years and now they're happening every six years so there's all this you know, boris is basically investing four billion on um flood defense and for us that's the market that we're looking at because what i re we really want to do is actually make sure that actually when you are doing these flood defenses actually can, how how are they integrated into um the landscape um they, they shouldn't just be sort of dumb infrastructure. What can they really be? And then there's a big thing, which is like Brexit. I mean, this is the other big thing, which is that we've just um, um, you know, left Europe. And then the image on the right was taken um, just before Christmas, I think it was, when um, uh, border controls and checks and balances were um, you know, um, being negotiated. What's really going to happen? I think the jury's out is it's sort of interesting depending on uh who you speak to regarding how optimistic they are or pessimistic regarding brexit but the image on the right is a bay it's a bay of a station that we're designing for crossrail for, and it's for bond street station and that's our team inspecting one of the bays and it's being made in holland and when i talk to um suppliers in europe they say look we just want to build in the uk uh, because you guys are always pushing the boundaries um, and you're investing a lot in infrastructure so my sense is that actually trade will still, still happen but when i was listening to the conference yesterday from Clyde Co, they were saying america africa has loads of opportunities but they're going to have a lag for a year simply because architects and engineers cannot fly there right they just cannot get there to actually sort of sell their services so it's quite interesting this thing about us working from london and not getting on the plane and not seeing the sights i'm not so sure i think i think to do a good job you still need to really sort of like travel um but this relationship with europe i think will slowly iron out over the next few months on the left that's our studio we're based in clarkenwell where the rest of the architects are um and on the right literally within a day i mean if we said i just emailed my head of it now regarding uploading skype and if i said to our skype manage uh, sorry our it manager a year ago listen can you set up um everybody to be able to work from home he would have said yeah i'll take you two years and it'll cost three million we did it overnight we did it overnight so it's, it's sort of really bizarre how adaptable it was but to be honest work from home um isn't great and it isn't great especially for the young um because they normally work for the bedrooms etc so we're very keen i think in spring when everybody's had their jabs um, is to come back into the studio. But what are the big things that are happening within the industry? Um, planning, right? planning for the future. I mean, this is a white paper that's uh, currently being issued by the government, which is all about um, how to uh, allow for good development 
to occur and to get the community on board. So in a nutshell, what this really says is that the community that live in a place will be consulted about the development that they want. Once that's agreed, all the developers and all the planners know exactly what is expected. And so you can build. Right? So what it's trying to do is it's trying to stop any obstruction in terms of construction. That is that consultation at the moment. And depending on who you talk to, which party, um, my local Labour MP here says it'll just be put, thrown out. And others say that'll be pushed through. Who knows? But the, but the attitude is to listen to the people that live in the place. And on the right is Sadiq. I mean, that's a sort of a statement that um, Sadiq made. He had a sort of kind of framework for architects. And basically he looked at it and he looked down the list and he said, it's too white. He goes, what, why is it? So I, I was just submitting a tender for a station um, in, in East London. And the question uh, from the client was, can you demonstrate how the people in your design team reflect those that live in the borough that the station is, which is newer. So these are the sort of questions that you are now getting. Um, and the actually the other thing that they asked for was that um, you will, should we give you the job, you will take a local graduate and employ them for a period of six months. So it was really interesting how procurement now is saying that what we really want is for you to put your, you know, is to basically engage with the people and, and, and in a way demystify what you do. And I think um, I think your school is very good at engaging with the people that use the buildings. But I think maybe other schools, um, that's not so much their priority, but it now has to be. And collaboration, I think collaboration is a word that's been sort of banned around a lot, but it's sort of like, I always say smart collaboration. And um, this woman here, Kate Bingham, she is, uh, she was on the news just recently. Boris basically gave her the task to get jabs in people's arms as quickly as possible. And what she did, using a very small group and some of the contacts on her iPhone, was created a team whose objective it was to get as many vaccines um, distributed across the country as possible. So I also with collaboration, it's very much about individuals and your network. And I think, you know, you as students now, um, you're part of a network now, and actually you should keep uh, in touch with those folk and know who the good folk are, because there's going to be opportunities in the future to work together. So how are we going to be working? Well, on the left there is like, you know, sort of like images of our, our lovely studio. And actually what we're doing at the moment, we're using all sorts of software like on the right where we're actually um using digital software and tools to almost have a pinup board and i think that's really important i'm doing some crits next week at kingston where they they've insisted on this sort of board so that i can flick through the 10 drawings that they would normally have on the wall whereas with a pdf presentation like this you just get to see one at a time and actually that really really helps because basically as a species what you can't what it's really hard to do is memorize things one after another you need to sort of reflect and see things around you so my hot tip to you all in your bedrooms is to literally fill a wall with with, with stuff don't leave it in the head stick it on the wall and then what is the future so this is a drawing that we did because we we see sort of new offices effectively being just as, almost like factories you know where you go in you might have a meeting, you might make a 3D model, you might catch up with pals, <laughs> you might do a bit of drawing. You know, they're going to be really sort of flexible spaces. And the question for most of most sort of like owners is, um, is actually how do you distribute that space? What are the priorities? How flexible should it really be? But interesting times because it's going to happen across the piece. My gut feel is that actually the home, the hybrid working, um, um, people would insist on it so organizations that don't do it have really good talent work, work for them so what we're doing at the moment is that we're going to be basically having sort of three two um, um sort of um working environment which is flexible and trusting and and what happens is that managers need to manage when people come together because when people come together that's when they share their ideas how often should you really do that and, and this is a drawing, I just thought I'd show you this. This is a drawing that was done on an iPad. You know, it was like, that's what we're doing now. Um, and um, 
And I think what you still need to do though, you still almost, the people that have done this are the ones that actually could draw beautifully on an A3 anyway. So I think now more than ever, if you're drawing, keep on drawing with that, with that pen because actually you're gonna be communicating more and more in that way. And this is um, uh, here east, um, this is the gantry. So on the image on the left, um, that was the gantry, which was effectively a piece of structure that held all the chiller equipments um, that cooled right, the big shed that was broadcast center for the Olympics. It's in Hackney, um, when we cleared the Olympic site, um, all the art studios that were there had to go. And so what the developer said, Delancey, was that we want to put them back. And so what you see on the right there is a series of bespoke um, studios, right? But they were created by using Rhino and scripting. We work with WikiHouse, who are essentially digital fabricators. So we've actually got in our place, we've got three. So if any of you are into scripting, I don't know if, if that's a thing in Sheffield, but um, like my boy who's 11, you know, what's keeping him alive? And he's shouting next door at the moment is he's just playing Minecraft with three of his pals. And the other, you know, sometimes at the weekend, he'll do like a 12 hour shift. And I'm sure on my part, that's neglect as a father. But um, he, you know, the sheer volume of, of things that he's doing on there is, is bizarre, but I really need to wean him off because he's addicted. Um, but I sense that, you know, he can go into this world here very, very easily. And it sort of is the future. You know, when I talk to our guys who do this, we've got three scripters and all they do is just do basically digital tools to allow for fabricators just to jigger. And they say, cut out the middleman. That's what they always say. You know, we'll do all the coordination and there's risk with that. But what happens? You know, where, where are we sort of going with that? And then this is like, God, the Dickensian days of, of um, and for anybody, I don't know if anybody's doing engineering in the room. But this guy on the right, hopefully you can see that the guy with the sort of like black tilt on it. His name is Chris Wise, arguably probably one of the best engineers in the country. He designed the Millennium Bridge. He designed the Velodrome at Hopkins. And currently at the moment, he's designing a bridge um, that's commissioned by Network Rail, and this is our client from Network Rail. And these guys here are all fabricators, so this is a consortium. So what Network Rail have said is that we're going to have engineers, architects, and the fabricator all in the room, and they're going to develop and design for a bridge. And we have two and a half thousand bridges in Network over, over our, our estates in Network Rail. And what we want to do is create something that's really efficient. And this was a mock-up. This was made in Coventry. I'm a cop, and I'm from Cov. And this was made in Cov. You know, bikes, the first bikes in the UK were built in Coventry. Um, so I understand. Um, and, and this is a bridge which is 18 tonne made out, sort of laser cut stainless steel. So it uses the least amount of material to span um the tracks and um this was a little mock-up that they sort of like made so i see this being the future um of of um aspects of infrastructure and and your world that you're going to enter is still going to be very much um bim right and there's two sort of like forms of software that everybody uses revit which is about say 75 percent and then um uh, Bentley, Bentley microstation so the picture on the left there is um a tunneling crossroad and there it is built and we had like an open day for the public. And what was interesting there was that we were the architects and we worked with the engineers. We, we actually drew all that. What you see on the left there, we drew. But then what we did is that we worked with a company called Brian and Wood. And Brian and Wood were like, there are third architects, third engineers, and third MEP. And what they do is that they work with Langle Rourke and ourselves to design the fabric of the skin and the structure that will be supporting it. Now they have rebranded themselves as a tech company, which is really interesting. I'm wondering if you're a tech company, like, like Elon Musk, can you charge yourself out of like 200 pound an hour rather than 85 pound an hour, which is what you charge yourself out as an engineer. So it's really interesting how construction companies or engineering co consultancies are now moving over because they've got the, they've got the brains, they've got the software, and actually they've, they've got a, um, a niche in the market. I think that's gonna grow. I really think that's going to grow. But finally, I want to show you this, the project that I'm, I'm, I'm currently sort of like, um, uh, that we're delivering, which is the Thames Tidewater Tunnel, big infrastructure project, big civic project. And the image on the bottom left with the little girl in the red um, is the new public ramp that we're designing in the River Thames. Um, and it's a site in Blackfriars in the city of London. But the image on the right is um, 
the artist that's created the sculpture and his name is Nathan Coley. And so there's the artist there in blue, right? And he's looking at the detail because effectively this is his sculpture. And then the orange is, um, is Fiona. So she's a part two at the time, she's just qualified. And that's Roger Hawkins, by the way, who I'm sure will be around to give you a talk one day. And that with their funky poncho is Amy Corbell. She is the engineer that is designing the sculpture. And Amy Corbell is the engineer you probably heard of the Sofa Time Pavilion um, every year, basically, an architect that hasn't designed in the UK is given the commission to design the pavilion for like um, three months. And she is the engineer that designs every Sofa Time Pavilion. So, but I suppose I put it this slide because you can have all the algorithm and the scripting that you like, but effectively what you're really buying is a sort of like human idea, right? It's all about the people. The computer very rarely ever plops out the answer. Um, there'll be lots of people in the world of tech that says, yes, it does. Actually, it doesn't. You're not really buying that. That's just a tool. And, and this is, um, I suppose, the big thing about sustainability. Um, um, this is Rahila. Rahila um, started off as a part two. She's doing a part three at the moment. And she was um, recently one of the sort of up and coming stars. She's devoted the past year to developing this tool here, which is called HBurp. And what we've done with that is that we basically put into um, a piece of script the embodied carbon within all of the building materials that you would possibly use and more. And it's what we are able to do then is look at the embodied carbon within buildings. Now here, what we tend to do is we said, don't knock the building down, keep it. Why? Because concrete is the, concrete is, I suppose, carbon devil, you know, a phenomenal amount of energy goes into car into concrete. So if you can retain it, and we did that lovingly with um, with Park Hill, and then what we've got there in the middle is um, Southbank um, um, University, and on the right is the Bartlett School of Architecture. So before it was called Waits House. Why? Because Waits, the contractor, actually built it, and I think they must have given it a, a good price, and so they put their name to it. And what we did is we kept the frame. So we. So there you go, 440 tons of carbon has been retained because we didn't knock it down, right? We effectively gave the building steroids, made it 30% bigger, um, and it's a real sort of success. But this is what we do. This is a school that we designed. This is a swimming pool on Freeman School. So we use timber. Now, well, the great thing about timber is that, well, actually, embodied energy from a, from a tree, and then the tree goes back again. It's fantastic. But timber is light. And when you have a light structure, that means that you need less foundations. So what foundation is made out of concrete, so you need less concrete. And then what we were able to do is look at the composite parts of the building and then basically look at all the embodied energy within um, the structure. And there you go, the light gray there, 49%, that's steel, right? So that's just the steel within the structure. Um, and um, so, so we, we've got this tool and actually what we've done with this tool is that we've given it to all, all architects for free. Every time they use it, the data that they put in we get back, so it's a bit like a Google search engine. We get all the information. What do we do? We then basically grow our library. Um, and um, and we're doing things like this with it. So what we're able to do now is that Revit, we drew this building. This is a, a Victorian school in Hackney. And the developer said, look, let me have the site. And what I'll do is I'll give you a brand new school as long as you let me build some flats above. There was a lot of objection at the time they said no 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 you know we just want our school with a playground and you can do your flats elsewhere but the borough said look we're getting a free school and then um, we reminded everybody that this is the highest spec state primary school in the country that's what the developer was giving back and i think you're going to see more of this i see the future being more hybrid developments especially on brownfield sites but what we were able to do there is that with the revit model we stitched in all the carbon matrix into the Revit model. So as you're sort of shaping it and drawing, etc., it always plops out, right? And so what we've got is that we've got all the energy. So you're going to be working in this way. You're going to be using sort of like, you know, particular CAD protocols because the information that comes out is critical. And developers and landlords and clients, they will want to basically design and develop the most efficient buildings, right? Why? Because... Uh, you guys will only buy working places that are really, really efficient. Right? So it'll be on a demand as well. But the practicality of it, so this is um, Agar Grove on the left, which is um, a passive house, um, social housing, right? 
but look you've still it's still got to work so what you've got there is basically um you're basically seeing how leaky the building is right so that's what they do they basically seal up all the building and then they push air in and then they see where it leaks right how leaky is it and that's what passive house is right it's basically recycling um air um hot air and then basically pushing it through um, after it's been cleaned right so basically i mean half these people here they barely put their heating on whereas i'm living in a sort of 90s or like 30s house and it leaks like a sieve and it's really hurting me especially next week when the temperature drops um and this was really collaboration because i don't know how you guys work but this is i was um teaching a unit at the london school of architecture um i don't do that anymore but this is really interesting a couple of years ago where uh, the, the guys here were basically speculating they're saying like this there's too many Amazon deliveries going around because in back in the day, everybody would get a delivery in their offices. At one point, we actually we actually hired a new receptionist purely to log the Amazon deliveries in our office. I think that was half of her time just doing that. Now it's all changed, right? Because everybody's at home, so everybody's getting deliveries. But what they were saying was that rather than having white vans drive into the centre of cities and pollute them and congest them, imagine if they just stopped at hubs, right? And what you did is that when you went home, you picked her up from a hub. And so what they did, they did was that they looked at how some of those hubs might manifest themselves within the suburbs. And that's happening now, right? That's what's happening now. It's really bizarre. We're actually designing places now where you have Amazon hubs. It's really sort of fascinating. And I, look, I don't know if you guys know um, um, uh, this person, but it's Praneet. Praneet is chef for the alumni. So she did an undergrad at Bath. And then she, uh, I convinced her to the Sheffield Collaborative and she'd been working on the Thames title with me. And she just recently, last year, got her part three. What, she's actually standing next to a Bazalgette um, uh, service, uh, uh, what's it called, um, structure. And um, she's on site. So she actually got her part three while she's designing um, uh, that space there which is um, the embankment, this new public realm in the River Thames. But what was interesting here was that she was really interested in public realm because she was working on infrastructure. And then what we did is that the practice worked with her and sat on, in a way, allowing her to research something that she was interested in but good at. And the practice benefited because she actually wrote a thesis, a thesis on, um, on public realm. And now she's been able to put that into practice and I find that really fascinating because um, you know you're spending a year two years focusing on something which generally contributes back into the back into the industry and this is Tom Tom's another Sheffield God I'm really promoting Sheffield at the moment and um, he's great I mean he started with us he's again Bath strangely Bath and uh, Bath do this weird course where basically after your first year you've got to go to practice for six months and then again for the third year so i remember taking him on as a young 19 year old but he was amazing it was like having a part two he was ferociously sort of like ambitious his big thing was prefabrication of dfma so he wrote his thesis right he did the shepherd collaborative and he spent a whole year just doing dfma and like you know he's hanging out with people from like langer rock who ray rock's got this massive factory that does do dfma and what is he doing now? He's doing all of our DFMA detailing for some of our buildings. And there he is looking really sort of like suave and important, snagging uh, a motor joy, um, which doesn't need to be snagged because it was made in a factory 200 miles away. Um, and um, this is me. This is I, I, I do a lot of infrastructure and I tend to work with a lot of artists. And this is um, Danny Barren. He's a French man. So I was a project architect for, if anybody had been to London town recently, um, Tottenham Court Road Station upgrade. And, I spent eight years working with this chap here, Danielle, and it was um, amazing because I spent lots of time having long lunches talking about the meaning of art with him. Great, great guy. And um, and I wanted to talk about, I suppose, in a way, the thing that um, the, the sort of scripters can't do, you know, the people that go to Google can't do. And what that is, 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 is tell you things like, why, what does red make you feel and why? And I think as architects, um, that is what the client really... Um, wants to sort of understand and I think what, when, you, when you're doing architecture you're sort of part psychotherapist as well um, why do we like the things that we like um, and and this is basically um, like a sample board um, created by uh, our team um, 
Why? Because we were designing uh, a couple of towers um, in East London. And what we really wanted to do was animate the facades using colour. And, and the two people there you see is, um, that's Morag. Morag Morrison is married to Russell Brown. And um, Morag has a, uh, she's head of interior designer. She's got, I think she's got a master's in colour theory. And that's Seth Rutt. So Seth Rutt's my co, so I head of infrastructure, Seth has residential. So Seth was like the project architect, a partner for this project. But what we had was that we got our scripting team to write a series of algorithms to enable us to put in like color pots and swatches. And it spat out loads of different permutations of colors that may or may not go together based on sort of like the color wheel. But ultimately it was people that said, it has to be that red there. So that's really sort of interesting. We never really relied on the computer. The computer was just a tool. And that's, this is a visual. So this is essentially what it will, what it will be looking like on one dusky day um, in East London in a year and a half. And guess what? We're building it and we're building it using the thing that Tom Cunningham did, right? It's all offsite. It's designed by Mace. So we're working with Mace and what Mace are very keen on doing, the contractor, is to basically erect this building as quickly as possible with the least amount of defects. And as safely as possible. And um, so this is amazing. This is like flying up um, as we speak. And again, I think that's going to be the future. You know, it's going to be about actually software technology, detailing, new modern methods of construction. You're going to be part of that arena. Um, and this is a big thing that's been talked about, or, you know, heavily, I think, since the Black Lives Matter over the past year. And there's been a lot of... Um, 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 commentary within the architectural press but it's about communities and I look I, I'm, I'm talking to the converted here I think Sheffield University are sort of an exemplar in this this is what you do this is in every fiber um, but it's really about how do you how do you engage with the people that are going to be using the space what sh how should you really do that and I think as an industry we're still coming to terms with that so we're currently doing a piece of public realm for the city of london this is smithfields the meat market and we've commissioned an artist larry who's actually going to be um doing a series of consultations um and this is a housing scheme that we did um this is social housing for peabody and actually one way of engaging with the communities because they were living in, in these sort of 60s developments for a couple of generations and we had to basically renew that so one of the things we did was we, we carried a series of workshops with them and artists to really, in a way, not to make things really, but if anything, just to really sort of like listen. It was an opportunity to listen. And I think, I think we're going to be expected to do that more and more. Well, the client's asking for that. Um, we've done really well as a practice because it's something that's been in our DNA. And I think that's why we always find Sheffield, um, we always find that you're always a really good fit because we sort of like think alike. But there's lots of practices out there that don't, strangely. They still don't very, they don't think about um, how to communicate with um, the folk that are going to be using the building. And this is a, a scheme that we did recently, which is for Solihull Station. I don't know if there's any Brummies um, in, the, in the room. But look, Back in the day, when you do consultation, you'd be standing outside of the station, you'd be asking people having questionnaires. We couldn't do that anymore. So we did it all digitally. And actually, the reach was phenomenal, you know, because when you're waiting there and you're standing there, normally you get the same sort of people approaching you. You know, they're sort of inquisitive. Um, they want to know what's going on. And um, usually you get the same voices. But this way, actually, digitally, actually, you can really sort of get under the skin of the community. And people are able to overcome that threshold fear, right, in terms of engaging with someone with a clipboard and some boards. So I think that is very much is going to be a given, even when we sort of like all have the jabs in our arms. And then this was social value. Social value, I mean, I'm sure someone is doing a master's in this, but we actually have a researcher, Michael, and what he did was that he basically looked at projects in all of our different sectors, and he looked at the social value of those. Um, so everything from the economics, if you build a new bridge, what does it mean for jobs and employment and well-being and travel, you know, um, to universities as well. And that I think is going to be a metric more and more. Um, and I think what everybody's trying to grapple with at the moment is like, well, how do you measure it? Right? How do you measure that? And I think what that will do, the government craves it, the government wants to know what those figures are. 
but I think at the moment it's not quite washing through the industry as holistically as it could be. And this is in Parkour, by the way. So that's Roger Hawkins. And what we did was that we said, right, wonder what it's like to live in a flat that we designed. And that little you know, on the bottom there, you can see, you know, 1500 Turks, well, that's a disabled wheelchair tennis circle. So what we did is that we looked at, we basically did the day in the life of, and we said, right, what's the concierge like? What's the front door like? What's the lighting like? What does it feel safe being in this lift? What's the staircase like? What's the acoustics like? Yeah. And um, it, that was really interesting. And now the one of the Reba work stage, which is Reba 6, is post-occupancy evaluation. Before you never had to do that. Whereas now the client is paying you to go back into the building and you will basically ask them, the user group, you'll check the performance rate, the heating, all that sort of stuff. And then what you'll do is that you'll summarize and you say, actually, you asked for a great building, but we sort of gave you an eight out of 10 for all these reasons. But what you're meant to do is learn from it and then put all that knowledge into the next project. And then the, I wanted to sort of like end on, on a thing. I, I, I'm a speaker for school, so I do a lot of talks um, at some schools. And why? Because we're really keen to get people in from a whole range, diverse range of sort of like communities into the industry. And um, so we tend to do a lot of outreach work with schools. And, um, and this is something that I did at my son's school. Um, and um, I, I managed to rope in some part twos from Westminster. But these two women here, they're actually engineers from WSP. And we were designing some bridges. And um, I remember like uh, three of the kids came up to me afterwards and they said, that's the best lesson we've ever had. And the school teacher was really annoyed by that. And um, so I said to her, um, I said, really? And, um, but it's amazing uh, the impact that you can have on children. So I would encourage you when, when you go to practice, Reba has lots of initiatives for you to go out there. Um, but we're doing it digitally as well, right? We couldn't go to schools at the moment. Kids are having a really, 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 really tough time. So what we did do is that we did um, a series of workshops. And um, this is a sketch of the Bartler by, um, by one of the students, which is great. So it can be done. What you've got to do is get those connections. Um, I mean, you guys, I think, no, God, that was only a few years ago. It was like five years ago when you were, when you were there doing the same thing. And um, this is, um, I mean, so that's, always been sort of you know he's been really good at um earn as you learn to make um, architecture more affordable one of the things that we did is spearhead the architecture apprentice and i think this in part a bit like the sheffield collaborative is the future so on the left there you've got a pinder who's a graduate who has just joined us she's working in infrastructure and she did her undergrad at coventry she lives in um, slough in west london and um so she's working on um local street station for Crossroad and she's studying at South Bank and in three years time so she's got a degree in the bag she's just started with us in three years time she's a registered architect and she had we're paying her four days a week right she has no fees so she's earning as you're learning and um like I'm meeting her tomorrow she gets like two crits a week in the office for an hour each and then she has crits at South Bank as well and uh, just the other morning, I did like a, a schools. Uh, she went back to her old school and she did a, you know, this is what architects do. Um, so she had a, she's having a great time with this. But I see that being the future. I think South Bank now has about, say, 60 graduates on its course. And uh, the government's promoting it, right? So the government subsidizes a lot of this. And then finally, you know, we, um, we had a, a, I don't know if you heard of the London Festival of Architecture, but basically they, they sent out a little, uh, a competition and it was basically designed a float for the London Festival of Architecture uh, for the LGBT. And so actually we've actually in Hawkins Brown, we've got a, an LGBT group. And so they all got together and then one of them, um, Jonathan Chan, who's who basically is Mr. Man with the iPad, and he, he's an amazing drawing, drew this. And then within six months we built it and there you are on Oxford Street. So what's really interesting now is I think m more and more there are opportunities to realize projects and i think what you're going to find is um more of these projects especially in the regions outside of london sort of like materializing um because they they you know they have a great sort of um uh they have a great reaction from the people and only do them but also the people that, um, that that they serve so you know watch this space i think you'll see a lot more of it and that is me